Hey everyone, so today we're going to be talking about some lab updates in our testing room here. Uh, I spent the last couple days working on setting up some more of the Fantastic plus a thermal tester now. Finally cracked the code for what to do with the mess of data that comes out of this machine. It's been a hell of a time trying to figure it out. I'll talk about all that today. So we're going to update you on this progress. We're also going to update you on this progress for the sound chamber where Patrick Lathan on the team has been working for basically a week or two just trying to figure out how exactly to set up the microphone and resolve some weird troubleshooting issues we've had along the way. We'll also today be working with Mike over here in the, in the king's throne uh, to talk about some of our fan testing equipment stuff we're building out of blocks of foam. So it'll be a fun update for you with the state of the lab. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the Thermaltake Tough Ram XG memory. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG series is a freshly updated line of RGB memory available in frequencies ranging from 3600 megahertz up to 4600 megahertz. Thermaltake's Tough Ram XG uses 10 layer PCBs and heat spreaders affixed with bright LEDs everywhere and they market toward overclocking support and capabilities. Learn more at the links in the description below. Okay, so I wanna walk you through some of the stuff. This is gonna be completely unscripted. This is just us giving you an update for everything we're working on. Uh, we have another channel, by the way, called GN Extras, where we've been posting a lot of this type of stuff. I have more in the pipeline for it. It's basically behind the scenes, test setup, test research, methodological stuff, anything that leads up to the main channel videos, we're putting on GN Extras. So uh, it's kind of like, I mean, it's just extra stuff you can watch if you want to see more of this. But today we're putting it on the main channel. So for the fan tester, a couple things I've struggled with. Um, let me get this turned on and I will show you what it is that is challenging with it. Okay, so allow me to introduce you to the problem. It's this, it's this chart. The machine produces a crazy amount of data on fans, so we can get PQ charts, or curves as they're called. It tests everything from uh, different RPMs versus different resistance. We can get different pressure and flow for different uh, fan configurations or settings. We can test it with radiators or filters mounted to it. Uh, you can overlay curves of like the resistance provided by a filter or radiator versus an individual fan. The problem is it makes so much data that really no human can read this chart. It's not really, I mean, people who are systems engineers can read it, but even then it's a pain in the ass. So my job in our position is to take this type of stuff and basically just spend hours thinking about how to reconfigure it so that it's usable data, so it makes sense to the audience, makes sense to me, and so that there's this glanceability factor where you can glance at the chart and just intrinsically understand what you're looking at. Whereas this, if you glance at this, I'm sure some of you in the audience have looked at PQ charts and it's not a big deal, but if it's your first time seeing this, you're like, uh, what the hell am I looking at? And you close the video and you leave. So we're trying to get this to a state where the data is actionable for the end user. I don't, it serves no purpose for me to publish this and be like, look, trust us, it's a good fan. And then flash that for five seconds and move on. So that's what I've been working on. Uh, I'm really happy because over the weekend I came up with some ideas finally for how to really start doing fan testing in a way that we can produce a lot of data that's, that's usable. So we are doing PQ charts like this, but I'm gonna condense it down into bar charts that are comparative between different fans. We are also doing adding thermal testing. This is a dummy heater. We had these built custom a while ago. Uh, so this one up here, for example, is an AMD Ryzen one that we custom engineered with the company that built it. It's got three different resistive loads in it, and uh, you can do this with MOSFETs too. But uh, basically this one simulates a Ryzen three chiplet design, and you could power up here, you see the three different uh, plugs. You can power each one individually, the different power levels. You could do it as a, a two chiplet design if it's like a 3800X, 5800X, uh, 5600X, something like that. Or three if you do like 5950X simulation. Anyway, this is a heat load. And so is this. This is an Intel style one. The entire point of these is to produce heat. And they produce a fixed amount of heat in the, turn, in the form of power going into them. So for this one, we can do up to three amps at 115 volts. Uh, so we'll probably be pushing a little over 300 watts for most of these tests and we can scale it down if we need to. And you can see what I've done here is I've built an open loop and the open loop will never change. So the whole point of this open loop, just like most of the other test apparatus, like this much bigger, more complex chamber, is that you have a fixed utility 
that never changes, so it's a control, right? Basic scientific method, you have controls, you have variables. The cooler, the water cooling, is the control. We don't care about testing water cooling on this device, we care about testing fans. So the cooler is hooked up here to a 120 mil rad, because this is currently set up for 120 millimeter radiator testing, fits flush with the plate, and anywhere it's not flush, I stopgap it with uh, a basically a kneadable eraser so that the flow just goes straight in. And we can mount a fan to it as well. And then what we do is we can now test the fan for its thermal performance because since all of this is controlled, swapping only the fans means that's obviously the variable. So just for sake of discussion, I haven't figured this all out yet to the fine details, but we'll talk about it when I do. Let's say there's 300 watts. Uh, let's just pretend that the dummy heater, which is measured by this thermocouple that's uh, actually embedded in the, the IHS of the dummy heat load, if the thermocouple at 300 watts reads, let's just say 70 degrees Celsius or something, with fan X on this radiator, we swap the fan, we put fan Y on it, and we've noise normalized them at the same noise level. So let's say 30 dBA, 35 dBA, something like that in, a, in our old testing methodology. Then you can start to see the actual differences beyond just pressure and flow. So pressure and flow are really the only true numbers that matter for fan differences in terms of performance. But realistically, uh, it's not a linear translation to performance with how you use it in a computer. So having significantly better pressure or flow performance or a better operating point, more optimal operating point where there's a crossover, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see a huge difference, especially not one worth, say, $30 versus $20 on a fan in your computer. So that's why we've introduced this. This adds a real world element that can relate everything from the fans back to how you actually use it in real life. So that's the point of this. And just to sort of address the question, uh, dummy heaters are far more reliable than a computer. It will last basically forever, whereas a computer at some point you're gonna have a cap or something die, let's say in five years. Uh, so in terms of what's creating the heat, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that there is heat and the dummy heater here underneath the IHS is actually machined precisely to an Intel size IHS and the heat is positioned precisely as the die would be under the IHS. So it's a very good synthetic test, yet it represents real world use because power is just power. It's not special. It doesn't matter if it comes out of a computer or out of a dummy heater, it's just power. And so all we care about is moving the heat. And that's what this does. Anyway, that's what I worked on over the weekend. Uh, this has QDCs in it. So these quick disconnects, you can buy them for your, your normal open loop computers too. These are just so that I can swap out the radiator for a, uh, a 140, or if we wanted to, we could go up to a 180 or even a 200 millimeter radiator and test the, the characteristics for fans mounted on those. So for all the other stuff, let me walk you through those. This rack has the distribution plate plus pump attached to it. There's just some EK stuff we had that we weren't using. It's all good quality stuff. Uh, allows me to mount it. We we're tracking when it was filled, what it's filled with, and if we need to purge the liquid every now and then, we have a record of it. The uh, underneath part here, this is the power mainframe. So this mainframe has different power modules in it, and they all look like this. So this is a power module. Uh, these we bought used from actually a, <laughs> from the U.S. government. Uh, well, actually, technically one of their military contractors, but I guess they just sell those things used on eBay. I don't know. That's really changed how I view this type of stuff. But anyway, we bought these <laughs> for a good price. I also have a brand new one in here. These are different power loads. So we have everything from like 0.5 amps at say 50, 60 volts up to, in this case, uh, a 115 volt 3 amp. And we can configure those to power the dummy heaters based on what we're trying to simulate. And those all socket in. This is going to cleanly pull. Those all socket in back here. Each one of these is a power module. You can tell that's the expensive one because it's shiny. And, uh, and then we just turn it on up front and run it for the power load we want. It's all configurable through the screen up here. And we run the, I flip the power supply back here, which is just a normal ATX power supply. And there you can see it that is jumped with a 24 pin bridge. So that gets the water flowing. So just to be clear, all of this is only going to create one or two charts in the fan reviews. This is just for thermal. Thermal is not the key thing. We're still focusing on PQ curves. Uh, we'll be focusing on resistive testing, impedance, in other words. And, um, and this is just one component, but it's the component that allows us to relate it back a little more. And then we'll use that sound chamber over there to start generating things like noise normalized data. Um, sometimes you see people RPM normalize for fan testing. I think that's a little weird. 
I kind of see the logic. Um, this is, though, where different testing outfits or labs will have different methodological approaches. Uh, obviously, I, I think the ideas we've come up with are a good foundation. We'll improve them as we go. But RPM normalizing seems a little arbitrary to me. Because if you think about it, when you buy a computer fan, you set up your computer, you're not wondering, when, when you're reading a review, what fan should I buy? You're not going, man, I, I really want to set all my fans to 1,000 RPM. What's the best fan for 1,000 RPM? To me, that doesn't make sense. I don't think people buy that way. I think they probably go, I want the quietest, or I want the coolest, or I want the, the most efficient, where efficient would be the combination of quiet and cool, which one's the best at a, at a given noise level, uh, maybe on a curve. So you could plot it all the way up and down the curve and see where it falls. But I don't think people generally go, I really want my fans to run at 750, 1,000, 2,000 RPM, because that seems a little disconnected from how they're used in real life. Uh, but it's not bad testing to do it that way. I just think it's different. And it's different from, from sort of my interpretation of how a buyer would use our reviews. But if you have an idea for how you'd like to use them, let us know in the comments, and then we'll consider that as we work on all this. OK, last couple things here. This thing, I love this fan board. We bought this in Taiwan for like $9 US, and it was easily one of the best technology purchases I've ever made. It's just a fan tester board. Uh, or a fan power board, rather. You plug in Molex. Each Molex powers this line of headers. So they're all three pin. Um, that means it's just DC. But you can see there's 12 volts. There's 5 volts. I think there's 9 and 7. Yeah, there's 7.2 volt, 6 volt, 9 volt. This allows us to really easily control fan speeds for external projects. For the tester here, the way we'll actually do it is we'll plug into this uh, right here. This is a 4 pin. We've got a 2 and a 3 as well. So we'll plug into this thing. And then we can use the fan test machine to control the RPM. And it can either do that automatically, or we can switch it over to manual mode, which is where it is right now. And I can adjust the RPM. See right here, it says 100%, uh, 25 kilohertz. So this would allow us to control by PWM, so basically the pulse uh, signal, the strength of it. Or we control by RPM if we do DC. I'll show you one more thing on this, too, that I've been messing around with before we jump over to Mike or Patrick to talk about their work. So there's also a laser tack we haven't shown actually set up yet. I'll get that out, set it up. And then with editing magic, it'll be done instantaneously. So this is a really high-end laser tack. And the, the, the speed limit for what this tack can read for RPM is 99999. And the reason it stops at 99,999 RPM is not because the laser is limited. It's because the, the, the screen only has five digits on it. <laughs> so, so it's actually even more uh, precise than that. So that said, uh, I don't really consider this to be a relevant limitation of our testing equipment. I don't think we're going to look at a fan that is 100,000 RPM. But if you have one, let me know. I'll take out a different insurance policy, and we'll look at it. All right, so this is plugged in. Is there a laser? There is a laser. Let's just point that over here. So the way this works is very simple. You just put a, uh, a reflective, normally reflective piece of tape on the device under test. It spins through it. We have another laser tack too, but this one is insane precision and uh, can be positioned really precisely, which is nice. Um, just use screwdrivers and lock it into place. And uh, we don't need this, but it gives us a way to really accurately measure DC fans without a tack. So as you may know, a PWM fan has four wires in it. One of those is for tack, and uh, a DC fan is just going to be voltage, just DC voltage. So typically 12 volts, sometimes 5, 7.2. And the point of uh, that, that fourth pin on the headers is it gives you a tack readout, uh, which we won't have with three pin fans. So we can use this. Or if the four pin fan has sort of an unknown amount of poles in the motor, like let's say this, this is probably a four pin fan. Most of them are. I can kind of see into this one so I'd be able to figure it out. But sometimes it's not exactly clear. You can rotate it and figure out where it locks magnetically and take a good guess. But if we don't know and, and we need to know for the internal tack on the machine to work, then we can use laser tack. So that's what that's for. OK, so final points here on the machine. I want to just really emphasize how much data this dumps on us. So this is genuinely a bit of a mind fuck, for lack of a better word, where all these numbers, these are produced for only one uh, RPM. Uh, it's, so 30% duty cycle. Um, and this 30% duty cycle 
It generates all this stuff. It generates uh, all this for 40%, 50%. So we have all this data. And the problem is up here, so you see this is 0 CFM, and this is 0.67 millimeters aqua and millimeters H2O, so that's pressure. This is an unrealistic scenario for the fan to be in. Uh, it is going to be the highest pressure, but no flow. So the, the way to think of this is that's at the top end of the data we collect. The bottom end is maximum CFM, maximum volume movement, and really no pressure. So you can think of this two ways. If you have maximum flow and no pressure, it's equivalent to you taking the fan out of the box, plugging it in, holding it over your head. It's not actually doing any work. All it's doing is pushing the air through, but it's not achieving anything. So I just turned the air compressor on. I need uh, pressure to move the pneumatic devices in here, and Mike's going to help us out by highlighting them. Let's see if there's enough pressure to move it. Is it moving? Yeah. So those, you can think of them like vault doors to a bank, is how I've been describing them to everyone. Uh, those open up different nozzles, which have a different diameter, which allow us to test the CFM range of each nozzle as specified on the, the metal sheet on the front of the device. And so what we're ultimately doing with this is collecting some of the different numbers that you see in the chart. And uh, if you close them all, you end up with a uh, impedance, you have the high pressure scenario. Um, so anyway, we need to figure out how to interpret all that, put it into a chart. We'll probably end up pulling, most likely, I think what I'm going to do initially, let me know what you think. Uh, I think I'm going to pull max CFM, even though this is unrealistic, and max pressure. The only reason I do that is because I know a lot of the boxes for fans will put those two numbers on them, even though they're not realistic scenarios. So it gives us something to check against for the rest of the industry. And then for the more realistic numbers, we'll probably pull somewhere in the middle. Maybe I'll build a formula to calculate it so there's no subjectivity involved. But we'll probably pull somewhere in the middle. And we're also going to look for operating points where the two curves cross over. We'll report that to you as well. And I'll explain what all that means once we get to the methodology piece. So all that said, don't worry too much about the details yet. If some of this is like, uh, what's happening? This isn't structured very well. Because <laughs> I'm just talking about what we're working on. Like I said, we're going to have a methodology piece. It will be very long and in-depth, but we're going to explain everything. I am still in the experimental phase with all of this stuff, so I need to figure out exactly how we're using it. Once we do, we'll explain it. It'll be structured and formatted like you're used to. So, okay, I'm going to pass off to Mike. Mike has a specific job. You know, it probably you should show them what you did with this too. Okay. Uh, so Mike is going to be building some of the fan testing apparatus, I guess. Yeah, so today or later, we're going to be building a holder for these fans to basically secure them inside of the sound chamber um, without, you know, putting any extra metal or anything in there. We're going to use we're going to use this foam over here, actually. Yeah, this is closed cell foam, so it's very dense. Yes, very dense. Uh, there's specific types of foam. I didn't know this until a few weeks ago that there is high end foam. Right. <laughs> yeah, and this this is again coming from the recommendation of the sound engineer that that Steve's been in contact with and working with in in order to raise uh, you know the fidelity of what we're doing here. So right. So this will be for the the fan cage, which Mike will explain a little more in a bit. And then uh, let's show off the other solution you had for the cable pass. -through. Oh sure, yeah. Yeah. So when we did the initial walkthrough of the sound chamber, if you want to come over here, Andrew, we. Um, we had this hole and we didn't have a solution for how to prevent noise from leaking into the inside of the chamber. So I went and bought some pipe insulation from our local hardware store. And then I also bought this PVC cap that is just, you know, this is a standard pipe thread. So um, I bought a cap to put over it and we'll eventually, once we figure out exactly where the wires are going to lay and uh, how many wires we're going to have going in there, we'll cut a hole for this just to further seal it off. So it's not, not only going to be insulated, but we'll have this physical cap, much like on the other side. Um, there's a metal cap that it came with. So that way we've just got as much of uh, the hole sealed off to prevent any sound leaking in. Right, exactly. So that's kind of, that's what we've been working on. Um, I'm going to let Mike take point on building the fan cages. We need some for different size fans, yeah. as you know. So he's got a, a lot of sort of measuring and, and uh, cutting foam in front of him. Yep. But and some hot gluing. And some, some, hot some gluing. arts and crafts. Oh, we should mention that. Do you want to exp I'll let you explain why we're specifically using foams and not things like metals. Do you want to go over Sure. That? Yeah. So the, foams, the foam is going to help uh, absorb any vibrations or any sounds that the fan or the bearing 
um, generate, and it's going to keep it from reverberating off inside of the chamber itself. So it's basically just a, the most sound sensitive way to hold the fan. Right. Basically, it's just think of it as quiet hands, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> inside of the inside of the chamber, right? <laughs> exactly. You know, and if you have metal hands, those would make more noise and and you know invalidate or compromise the quality of the measurements that we're taking. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't want to use things that generate their own noise. Like if we used those metal brackets that you use on uh, like CPU coolers, right? Right. You hook them in. You hook it to the fin stack. Uh, they're for testing coolers, we'll probably do it the way they're shipped because that's a valid part of the product to sure. test. But for fans standalone, we're going to eliminate that variable because it's unlikely it'll be used and that you're probably mounting it to a case. And uh, any vibration or rattle that would be caused by a holder would just, it's not part of the product, so it's not really valid. So, uh, and like I said, with coolers, we'll probably just test them as they're shipped. Seems only fair. Yeah. So. And there are some, some that make weird noises. So, all right, I want to let Mike take over. And uh, we'll probably check in with Patrick in this one as well. If not, and it'll be in the next one. But to talk about some of the microphone setup here. Good luck. Oh. Let's work on some fan stuff. Today we're building the fan holders. And this is not going to be as exciting as the, um, the soldering or the pipe sweating video. But it will be more useful and produce data, unlike the hangers. But So I've got some wood here, I've got the hot glue gun. I've got a little test piece of foam here. Uh, I did a little bit of proof of concepting before we uh, roped our cameraman here in to film the making of video. But just to make sure that I could bind the foam with this, that it wasn't going to melt or anything. So that worked good. I cut off two little pieces of foam, and they are now very, very sick. Oh, I damaged it. but. Um, but it's very secure. It's super strong. Um, let's see. I've got I've got my fan here. I've grabbed a fan from our stockpile um, to use as a template for cutting the foam. Then I got our foam. There might be some trial and error to this process because, as as Steve was saying. In the intro or primer to this video, we're going to start uh, sharing a lot more of the behind the scenes stuff. And because of that, um, projects like this that are interesting to the viewers, uh, we, I'm actually not troubleshooting, not problem solving, not thinking about it at all so that we can capture it all on camera so you guys can see a little bit more about how we work and how we go about um, getting the work done that we're doing here. So. Okay, so it looks like Patrick's going to keep setting the mic up in the back. I wasn't sure if the mic was going to go here, but that makes a lot more sense than what I was thinking because you'll be taking the fans in and out but probably leaving the mic in place. So we'll go ahead and we'll start by taking a measurement of this so that we know how, how large the bottom of our, our fan holder, um, our fan cage will be. I think we're going to go ask Patrick uh, if this, the height of the microphone is going to be a constant, but I'm going to go confirm just to be sure. Because we want the microphone pointed, uh, I, I believe we want the microphone pointed centered to the fan rather than pointed at the top or the bottom. Patrick? Um, is the height of the microphone the height it's going to stay at? It might change, and I think he wanted to be Fine. able to adjust the height of the mic stand anyway. Beautiful. Alone at last. Actually, we're not gonna be alone. I gotta go get the. I gotta go get tools. <laughs> I'm getting the tool cart. I feel like there's lots of different songs that I can't think of right now that I'm gonna come to me on my drive home that I could be humming or singing. That sounded less cool. This is wood from the pallet that the sound chamber came in on. We really need to invest in a vise. I think we're at that size now, and now that we have a building, we need a vise. But one thing at a time, one thing at a time. What did we do to the saw, Andrew? I did I put it back in? <laughs> I carry around this Leatherman, and I remember this one video, Adam Savage made an argument that this is like a really fantastic tool to have and it's almost it's as good or better than having a handsaw like this 
And I found that to be true because I go hunting and when I'm trimming limbs as I'm going up trees, I use this and it goes through it so incredibly well to the point where I actually bought a folding um, saw for hunting and I don't use it. I, I just went back to this because it's just so much better. So I'm almost tempted to use this in, in uh, honor of Adam Savage. I'm sure some people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to use this. <laughs> it's totally fine because this is the piece we want to use. God, I'd be, I hope this piece doesn't like disintegrate. This is what we get for recycling and, you know, caring about the planet. <laughs> it's not very straight. Let's see if it fits. Wow. Unbelievable. So good. That's a cool shot. It's hard to think when you're rolling at me in a chair with a camera. <laughs> We're gonna cut this out now before we mount it to the rest of the assembly. Hopefully it'll be rigid enough. I think it will. And it's not very rigid now, but it's also just gotta hold it in place. It, it's, I guess it's okay if it moves a little bit. Hey, look, Steve. Hey, that looks good. Nice. I'm gonna make myself a little, a little workshop. This might actually work. <laughs> Our art skills, hot glue gun is up to temperature. Don't bother looking for this, you can't get this. This is industry exclusive stuff. Um, Steve had to compromise a lot to get uh, a hold of one of these. We did some bad things. Boy, that used a lot of the glue stick. That's a good thing we brought tons of ammunition and a positive attitude. There's a little gap from my bad cuts. The measurements were good. Steve told me to cut, measure a lot before cutting, and I did. Um, but he forgot to remind me to do a good job cutting, which is why. <laughs> why the cuts are kind of ugly. That's okay though. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Fast reload, tactical reload. Oh no. Everything's fine. <laughs> what is so funny? Boy, it'd be great if I had an extra pair of hands, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be? I'm actually pretty amazed at how not quickly this is drying. Behold, the holder. <laughs> this is our long-term durability test. I'm going to stand here for the next three days and do this. <laughs> Gotten. I've got my art skills on locked and loaded. Okay, so that's it for the lab update for now. We're going to do more of these, um, you know, depending on how into this you all are, it'll either go on the main channel or definitely we're putting more stuff on the GN Extras channel. So go subscribe to that one. I'll link it below in case you want to check out some of the stuff over there. But otherwise, that's the update for what we're working on for now. We have a lot of power supply testing updates as well. Those are currently up for Patreon backers on patreon.com slash gamers nexus. Patrick Stone walked through those. And massive thanks to all of you who have supported us through the store or through Patreon, because this stuff, there's a lot of behind the scenes hours or weeks sometimes that goes into figuring out how to use it. And it doesn't directly generate money. It eventually pays us, but that sunken cost that really having the support of people on Patreon allows us to invest the time up front to figure out how to use everything. So thanks to everyone over there. And uh, check back for more videos as always. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help out directly. We'll see you all next time.